Hello, and thank you all for joining us for today's discussion of clean indoor air. I am Alondra Nelson, and I lead the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Over the past century, we have made astonishing gains in public health by focusing on the basics of clean water, food safety, sanitation, and clean outdoor air, but not as much on clean indoor air. Our experience with the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated clean indoor air is a vital part of our pandemic preparedness toolkit and our public health toolkit. Taking steps to have cleaner indoor air, which can be achieved by improving ventilation, strengthening air filtration, and disinfecting air, will not only improve health and well being now, it's an investment that will benefit future generations and improve people's long term health. I want to be very clear. COVID-19 is transmitted through the air. As the CDC has said since May of 2021 on their website and the scientific brief on SARS-CoV-2 transmission, a main way that COVID-19 spreads is, quote, through inhalation of air carrying very fine droplets and aerosol particles that contain infectious virus. The same publication says that current evidence strongly suggests transmission from contaminated surfaces does not contribute substantially to new infections. Bringing more clean air into a room reduces airborne disease transmission and reduces the risk of COVID-19 transmission. For example, having five air changes per hour can reduce transmission risk by 50% or more. This is an achievable goal for our schools and our workplaces. I believe it's also enormously and it's an also an enormously empowering piece of information. Improving indoor air quality does not have to be in conflict with our goals of energy efficiency either. Combined with whole building tune-ups, tuning up the ventilation and air filtration systems needn't increase energy consumption. Today is the latest of multiple efforts by the Biden Harris administration to promote clean indoor air. We identified improved indoor air quality as an important tool to fight airborne pandemic diseases in the, in the American Pandemic Preparedness Plan last September. The National COVID-19 Preparedness Plan prioritized indoor air again earlier this month. And two weeks ago, the administration launched the Clean Air and Buildings Challenge. Clean indoor air can help protect school children, essential workers, and all Americans as we go about our everyday lives, at work, shopping, traveling, or dining out, from getting sick from COVID-19. Alongside vaccines, masks, and other forms of individual protection, clean indoor air can be a powerful multiplier of protection against COVID-19 infection. Of course, clean indoor air is also about more than just COVID. It helps improve public health writ large against other common airborne diseases like influenza and against indoor pollution sources like smoke and gas stoves that can harm our health, such as by exacerbating asthma. It's also an issue of equity, which is one of the cornerstone commitments of the Biden-Harris administration. Every day, essential workers may encounter people who aren't vaccinated or who may not be wearing masks so cleaner indoor air can make a huge difference for their lives and their health. Also, low-income rural and urban communities, communities of color, and native communities are more likely to live at the fence line of industrial facilities and areas with worse, with worse outdoor air pollution, facing higher rates of asthma and other health harms. And these same communities tend to live, learn, and work in older buildings without good air cleaning systems. Technologies and efforts to improve indoor air quality must be deployed in the communities most affected by poor indoor air quality. And so that in turn, all Americans can lead healthier lives. Many steps to improve indoor air quality can be easy and low cost, such as using a portable HEPA, uh, HEPA filtration system like the ones available at many local stores. You can even build your own with an affordable do-it-yourself option like the four filter and the box uh, fan cube called the Corsi Rosenthal box. Today, you'll hear from several leading experts who long before this pandemic began and since then 
have devoted their efforts, and in some cases their entire careers, to improving indoor air quality for the public good. They'll explain the science behind clean indoor air and what you can do to put the science into action and make a difference in your own community. This is important because there are steps that all of us can take to make our indoor air cleaner, not only for ourselves, but also for our friends, family, neighbors, and coworkers. We are all in this together. And once you know what you can do, you can help spread the word about what we all can do or ask for to, be, to make indoor, uh, being indoors uh, together safer. Because there is actually a lot we can do and a lot that your government is doing to make possible. The moment really is a historic opportunity. Last year's American Rescue Plan made available hundreds of billions of dollars for schools, universities, state and local governments, nonprofits, nursing homes, offices, and businesses like restaurants and gyms. Funding that can in fact be used to improve indoor air quality. For example, $122 billion were made available through the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund to help schools prevent the spread of COVID-19, including through ventilation improvements. Your school districts will know how to apply for these funds through your state education agency. Another example, $350 billion were provided through the state and local fiscal recovery funds to help state, local, and tribal governments support their local businesses, nonprofits, and the public sector. You can reach out to your local government to learn more about these resources. Additionally, the recently passed bipartisan infrastructure law will make available tens of billions of dollars for improving the health and safety of building occupants with improved ventilation in airports, bus terminals, and other transportation hubs, along with commercial buildings, low-income housing, uh, and other buildings. For example, the Department of Transportation's Airport Terminal Program provides $5 billion to upgrade, modernize, and rebuild, rebuild airport terminals across our nation, which can include upgrading environmental systems that would improve indoor air quality. So this is just a, a sampling of, of the resources that are available. These investments matter, but it is also uh, about our values. And frankly, it's a value that we all share. This is one of the most basic commonalities that unites us as human beings, that we all breathe air. That's why healthy and clean indoor air should become an expectation for all of us. It is a fundamental commitment that we must make to our children, to all of America's workers, to those who are med medically vulnerable, and to every person in the country. For decades, Americans have demanded that clean water flow from our taps and pollution limits be placed on our smokestacks and tailpipes. And our indoor air should be clean and healthy too. It's just as important as the food we eat and the water we drink. At the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, our aim is to elevate the expertise, drive the innovation, and communicate the science that will make clean indoor air possible for all Americans. But we know what really matters is where the rubber meets the road, and this is where many of you play a key role. So before we turn to our first speaker, I want to give a special shout out to those of you who are engaged in the care and in the work of keeping our buildings healthy day in and day out. The mechanical engineers and HVAC uh, experts, the union health and safety specialists, the industrial hygienists and environmental engineers, the building and facilities managers, the janitors and maintenance staff, and the state and local public health officials. Thank you all. Your expertise and efforts are crucial um, to making clean indoor air a reality. We are so grateful to you for the work that you do, and we're so glad that some of you are with us today. Before we get started, I want to thank everyone who shared comments and questions in advance. We have asked whether um, the content will be available afterwards for people unable to join. I can share that OSTP will post a transcript of this discussion on our website within the next week. We hope to address many of your questions related to the science behind airborne transmission, how to identify evidence-based solutions, and tangible ways to improve air quality throughout the event. As part of your registration, a number of you shared useful resources and innovations with us, and as we continue to make progress on this important topic, we want to continue to engage with you. 
Um, so please do share your thoughts, ask questions, um, and share your work by emailing us at indooraire, one word, at ostp.eop.gov. That's indooraire at ostp.eop.gov. I now have the great pleasure, pleasure of introducing our first guest, Dr. Zainab Tufechi. Zainab is a social scientist who studies the intersection of technology and society. She is a New York Times columnist and associate professor at the University of North Carolina School of Information and Library Science, a principal researcher at Carolina Center for Information Technology and Public Life, Life and a faculty associate at the Harvard Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Zainab, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me to this event. It's great to see you. So you've been a, a leader in this space and I wanna get started um, uh, right away diving in because I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, I know in a little while uh, that, that folks joining us will get to hear about the science behind airborne, airborne disease transmission. Um, but before we got to that, I wondered if we could start with a bit of the history of airborne disease transmission and public health which you've both studied and written about. Um, yeah, so for, yeah, yeah um, please go ahead. No, please, uh, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry, there was a, a single second delay. No, I was just gonna ask you to, to, to um, say some, uh, something about your work, about the, the sort of scientific discourse around airborne transmission um, in the 19th and early 20th centuries in the public health space and, and what we can learn from this public health history uh, for the work that we need to do today. Absolutely. So first, I want to thank you for that introduction. Um, like if we had started the pandemic on the kind of framework you outlined just in that, you know, short brief introduction, uh, I believe we would have had much better outcomes because we would have been more uh, accurately informed and empowered to combat this virus. So that uh, is incredible to hear. So to go back to your question, why did it take, you know, until now to be having these kinds of discussions? What could have happened earlier? Uh, and why was this um, the kind of sort of challenge that it was? Goes right back to what you're uh, asking me. And uh, as you noted, we'll be hearing shortly from, you know, Dr. Marr, Dr. Allen, people who've studied this their whole lives, and they were at the forefront of it as early as, you know, February, March 2020, kind of alerting us to the airborne transmission uh, with this virus and sort of the emerging evidence back then. But the reason that it was so difficult to get here and that we have so much more um, things and uh, we have so much more to do does indeed go back to the history that you are talking about because transmission how do diseases transmit is um i mean it's one of the big open questions of human history we've grappled with it uh, for all our history because infectious diseases in humanity we coexist and it's been um you know a challenge and a scourge for all of our existence and some of the earliest theories did indeed think that uh, these diseases transmitted to, through the air, uh, you go back to the, uh, the earliest writings, but of course we didn't have germ theory of disease until you know 19th century. Uh, in fact, we didn't have a uh, good understanding of what was going on. And for a long time, uh, in, in the modern era, including in the 19th century, there was a lot of debate about, you know, what could be causing a disease to go from one person to another or from a place to another. And there was this belief uh, that the bad air that was smelly, stinky, terrible, like that made you feel horrible, was the cause of a lot of disease, uh, just the, um, the noxious air. And these would be these could be termed like the miasma theories of disease. They were onto something, right? Because places that are poorly ventilated and smelly and the kind of sort of polluted places that are more uh, likely to be inhabited by the poor 
um, they do, you do see a lot more diseases in such places, but it's not because of some fantastical, you know, the smell itself causing the disease. It's, um, it's a correlation more, uh, more than an actual cause. And of course, this caused uh, challenges in understanding things like waterborne diseases, because you are trying to tell people that the smelly, terrible air wasn't causing the cholera, but it was this sort of clear glass of water where, you know, they didn't have germ theory, they didn't have markers because they couldn't even see it. You were trying to convince them this is what's causing the illness and not the, um, the smelly air itself. And that was this huge era of scientific advancement with the better understanding of um, modes of transmission. In fact, you know, the beginning of epidemiology as a science is often traced to John Snow, who figured out that cholera was transmitted through the water rather than the air. And there's a lot of interesting history there. Uh, but just like now, then uh, that was resisted both by the sort of, let's say the medical establishment and for people just like that, it took a long time to establish this. And that partly led to um, let's say an aversion to theories of transmission through the air because it was considered to be the unscientific version, like the miasma, the, just the smell itself, rather than what we now know to be the, tr uh, the true version, which is that, yes, indeed, uh, especially respiratory viruses that we breathe at are traveling through the air. So early 20th century, while we saw this incredible understanding and, um, advances in sanitation, as you note, which did cut down waterborne disease dramatically, which is essentially a public health miracle that we now take for granted. I, I, I didn't grow up being able to, uh, I, I grew up in Turkey and when I was growing up, tap water wasn't considered safe. It took me such a long time in the United States to just psychologically think, I can drink the tap water. I, I can drink the tap water. You know, that's just such a, because I, I live through it. It's such an incredible advancement. And we just take it for granted here. Um, so the water got a lot of attention, which was great. And a lot of other kinds of sanitation. And, you know, sort of we understood about the mosquito transmission that got a lot of attention. That was great. But public health remained Aver, you know, averse to the idea that diseases were transmitted through the air, but of course they were transmitting from person to person. So something was happening. And in early 20th century, um, a theory develops and uh, it's like, uh, just, I'm going to summarize it. And the idea was that it was the uh, things we kind of emit out of our mouth that are like big droplets of almost like watery stuff that fall to the ground uh quickly were the reason that people were infecting each other uh you know person to person so what was seen is that you know it's something that happens because we're just like kind of spitting out so to speak spraying spray borne stuff and it was considered that once they fell to the ground within about a meter or two three to six feet that's it they can't go anywhere else and this was considered the droplet theory and very interestingly as a sociologist um, kind of uh, outlook on this uh, the public health people thought and they wrote about this if the leaders who got this theory going thought that if people believe that it's through the air they'll be so scared that they won't do anything like there was this idea that if we tell them the air is at fault or is risky that you know because it's everywhere as you know that we breathe air they'll be so scared that they won't do anything they won't wash their hands they won't do this there was this both like a understandable fear of being uh, having the wrong version of the theory but also mistrust of the public that if we tell them something they're just going to get scared and somehow in that period, the idea that these spray droplets that only traveled short distance um, were the cause of that kind of respiratory transmission got established, I would say, as a dogma, because if you dig into the history, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Marr and Dr. Allen can tell you all about the science, if you dig into it, there were a lot of evidence and scientific reasons to think that's not just what was happening. And there's the, as they will explain, uh, the aerosols we breathe out, those little 
things that do float in the air are also more concentrated around the person. So distance does matter. They just don't necessarily fall to the ground plop ballistically. That was the incorrect error. Um, so what for the rest of 20th century, evidence kept accumulating, but in a very sociologically driven way, uh, it was either discounted, resisted, um, I have heard so many um, stories that uh, they, our other guests will be able to say more because they lived through it, where they would try to submit to leading journals with evidence and they would be dismissed essentially because, oh, we know it's droplets. This is how we entered the uh, pandemic. Um, and in fact, we did not know because there wasn't a lot of evidence, there was a lot of assumptions. So fast forward, and uh, when the pandemic started, this droplet dogma also immediately got repeated as if it was happening. And when it started, you know, that's all I knew too, because I'm not, unlike Dr. Mar and Dr. Allen, I'm not somebody who's, you know, worked on this uh, her whole life. Uh, when I started digging into it, and then when I started seeing the epidemiological evidence, which um, things like a choir where one person, this happened in uh, the United States in March, a choir where one person infected, uh, I believe 51 people out of 60, uh, which is an incredible number in one session, even though they were so trying to be careful in the way that they were told to be careful that they didn't touch the doorknobs, they, they propped open the door. You know, one person being able to infect like, 80, 90% of the people in the room is not really going to happen uh, through the touch or sort of the short distance stuff. It's clearly, and it's a choir, right? Aerosols are produced more uh, during uh, the um, singing. And there was the Diamond Princess ship where it was clearly spreading from person to person, even though people were confined in the room and droplet precautions, as they're called, were taken. So there was emerging evidence that... Um, was saying this is not just traveling a short distance. It wasn't transmitting outdoors. There's so much going on. And that's when I got interested and started trying to write about this. And what I witnessed was that efforts by scientists, and in fact, at some certain points, hundreds of scientists to appeal to the WHO, to appeal to the CDC, were rebuffed, uh, which is kind of tragic. Uh, WHO called uh, saying that it was airborne to be misinformation. And that's, that tweet where they said it was misinformation is still up, unfortunately. And the late corrections that came out were like muted and silent. And there was a sort of institutional inertia to admitting that, yeah, we got something wrong and we didn't recognize the emerging evidence when it was you know, coming out. So it took a very lengthy, difficult, um, and I know personally difficult for the scientists involved who are trying to make the case, um, difficult process to get to the introduction you gave, which is incredible, I think, for going forward. And sociologically speaking also, once you admit a respiratory disease is airborne, as not just this one, probably uh, all the others, um, there is a collective responsibility to treat it the way we treat sanitation. Right? We don't tell people you need to have a chemistry lab in your own house and test your water all the time and filter it. Otherwise, it's not your problem. We as a society, we expect clean tap water to be a right. And when that fails, that is a scandal that requires attention. And it took a lot of effort to get here. But when you admit it's airborne, that's the kind of thing that you need to then move on to. And you say, well, what do we do about it? Because... Yes, you can wear like the N95 masks that are more protective as a person for a while, but you need the systemic solutions. You need the schools to have the right kind of air filters and ventilation. You need the energy efficient versions of it. You need the research. You need all those other things going forward. And that's the part that I think is both tragic in some sense that we didn't move faster, but also really hopeful going forward because as terrible as this pandemic is, COVID is not the only respiratory disease. And, uh, you know, from RSV to uh, influenza to others, having better indoor air quality and listening to the um, aerosol scientists and 
you know, the other bio, uh, biophysicists and other people and virologists and immunologists who are on top of this topic early on, of which there were a few, having that kind of interdisciplinary co uh, cooperation and the government investment in the infrastructure and the correct informing of the mechanisms of this disease and all respiratory diseases uh, transmission can help lower disease burden overall because the other diseases, they also cause a lot of, you know, pain sure. and suffering. So that's kind of where we are. So I'm kind of both um, very sociological story as much as a scientific story as it happens often. But also now that we're here, I think a lot of hope going forward if we act the right way starting, you know, today is better than yesterday. I'm sorry, uh, I, what I mean is like today is the best day to get started. Yes, yesterday yes. would have been better, but whenever we start is great. Yes, here, here to that. Um, thank you for that, Zainab. I mean, certainly the scientific community has done a, a really excellent job of doing rapid studies and really highlighting the latest science on what was, you know, two years ago, a novel disease and one that today continues to evolve. Um, and, you know, it's been, I think, a challenge for lots of different sectors in the public health community. And, you know, I think the CDC has worked to incorporate the latest science in their guidelines, trying to, you know, provide the best public health recommendations. But, you know, it takes time and it's taken time for CDC, WHO, and others to recognize the importance of, of airborne transmission. But we are, we are here now together. Um, uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit, you, you wrote an article in 2020 um, uh, that was, um, you know, prescient that said that we need to talk about ventilation. So I'm mindful of time, but I wanted to say that, you know, one of the things that we've um, recognized here at the White House is, of course, the, um, the importance of ventilation and clean indoor air as one of the tools in the toolkit for improving public health, um, in addition to vaccines and, and masks and diagnostics as the, uh, and the like. So can you talk about um, how uh, efforts to improve ventilation and or air quality are part of this toolkit? Um, and also if you have, a, where I'm, I'm gonna be mindful of time, so I'll ask you to be concise, how we might think about advancing equity in this space. How do we work with um, uh, workers, those who are at most at risk and what's the benefit of ventilation to them? And how does ventilation compare to some of the other tools that we have in our toolkit? So that's that's a, that's a amazing question. I'll be uh, brief, but once you have the correct uh, scientific theory of how the respiratory diseases transmit, you actually have this incredible toolkit that opens up so many venues, and it is absolutely essential for equity. So to start with, um, if this virus is transmitting through the air, right, you have uh, we focus on masks, and masks are a very powerful tool, but uh, there are all these things you should be doing to get the virus to be diluted or filtered out of the air you're breathing before it even gets to you, right? So uh, one of the uh, things you can do is, once again, ventilation, which is have more indoor-outdoor air exchange so that it's kind of diluted outside. In fact, this is exactly why there's so much less transmission outdoors. The, uh, it dissipates much more quickly. It can't concentrate as much because there's so much more air moving around. Uh, and indoors, it can accumulate, right? It can sort of float, 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 accumulate in unventilated spaces. Now, um, I, I know Dr. Allen has done some uh, work on this about like, how do you make ventilation compatible with uh, energy efficiency? That's something we're gonna have to work on. Uh, it also means you can move certain things outdoors and you can do be more outdoors, which is healthier, which is healthier in general. But of course, that's not the only thing because ventilation is not always uh, either available um, in certain places, but we have proven standards. HEPA filters, uh, MER filters for air conditioners uh, do a great job of filtering the virus through the air and they can be uh, the correct I need to be the sort of the correct power, so to speak, to be able to do a great job depending on how many people. There's also, as you know, these cheap, you know, do-it-yourself options, the Corgi Rosenthal boxes where you can take these sort of powerful filters that are quite cheap uh, that can filter air and just tape them to a, a box fan and, you know, the, it does work. So you have those kinds of options. So also the equity part is absolutely crucial because just as you note, know, 
just like every other kind of pollution, every other kind of disease burden, the indoor air quality is demonstrably and um, systematically worse in poor communities and uh, which overlap greatly, of course, with communities of color. Uh, I, I, I am currently in New York and uh, there are like this direct correlation you see when you see the air quality studies and air quality in poorer schools and um, you know the sort of the the and how bad it is so if you improve air quality indoor air quality it helps kids concentrate it it lowers burden of disease like asthma and other um, because allergens are also filtered out through the HEPA filters respirate less respiratory diseases it's not just COVID, it's flu, it's RSV, it's this, it's that. Um, so, and also for um, for a lot of us, for people like me, you know, an academic, a writer, I could just work from home, but those people that we called essential, but we did not treat them with the respect they were deserved uh, early on in the pandemic, they ended up working indoors with lots of other people without the protections of, you know, the ventilation and the filtering. And it may seem like, oh, could we really do that? I feel like not only could we really do that, it would have been cheaper. It would have been cheaper than the disease burdens cost if you were just thinking about the finances and that doesn't even go into like the human suffering that would have been avoided. And some of the sort of solutions were like the HEPA filters that are just available for absolutely within reach of uh, a wealthy country like ours and also the other countries too. And in the long run, it will both be cost saving and health improving. So it's this incredible opportunity to do to the air, indoor air, what we did to sanitation and water that is no longer really in within living memory in wealthy countries, but it was a terrible burden on human existence. And what we did to outdoor air, which people don't remember, but the first Earth Day in New York, you can even read the sign in the photos because of the smog. And we decided like, and the pollution. And when we decided to move on that, we did you know, get a great sort of result uh, in just a generation. So it's this opportunity to put the clean air as a human right at the center of how we design our buildings, how we live our lives, how kids go to school, and then ask the question, how do we make this happen? And it will help as, I, as you noted with the questions of equity too, because these burdens tend to fall on the more disadvantaged people. So again, um, we are where we are. Uh, I wish we were here earlier, but it is what it is, but starting, and doing to indoor air what sanitation has been to water, indoor water and the water we drink, it will be um, an enormous advance. And I'm super excited to see scientists who are just about to follow me who worked on this their whole lives and to see the kind of work they do finally have the kind of um, positive results that it's capable of. Thank you so much, uh, Zainab, for um for your uh, research, for your, your candor, for um, running into the breach to do the great research and writing that you've done um, over the last two years that have just been so important for helping us make sense of the pandemic. So um, just to wrap up um, our time together, I just want to say, um, you know, that, that uh, you know, the White House is really committed to working and engaging on this topic, including with you and other stakeholders on this call. And it's going to really take a, a whole of government approach and coalition and innovative approaches to, to doing that. And um, we're really grateful for your leadership and those of the other experts from all across um, the country, across disciplines, who really made clean indoor air their mission, um, including through the recently released EPA Clean Air and Buildings Challenge, which we'll talk a little bit, a little bit later. Um, and we're happy to roll up our sleeves with you and others to leverage science-based resources um, developed on this topic over the past few decades uh, and the new findings over the course of the, the next two years. So to begin our next session, it's now my pleasure to turn things over to my White House colleague, OSTP Senior Advisor for Biotechnology and Bioeconomy, um, Dr. Georgia Lagudas. Um, and thank you again, Zainab. Georgia, over thank to you. you. Thank you, Dr. Nelson, um, and thank you for that great session. So next, we'll move into the second portion of our program, the basics of why you should care about indoor air. 
and we'll have two experts that will be joining us today to talk about the science behind indoor air and the importance of ventilation. As you heard, we'll have Dr. Lindsay Marr and Dr. Joseph Allen, um, who are both scientific leaders in this area and clean indoor air champions. Um, many of us today have seen their writing in op-eds and in scientific publications, so we're so happy to have them here with us today. So first, um, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Lindsay Marr, who is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Virginia Tech. And Dr. Marr is an expert on aerosol virus transmission, exactly what we're talking about today. Um, her research group studies pollutants that are both in indoor and outdoor air, and in particular, how these tiny viruses and microscopic organisms are carried in the air. She's published over 140 scientific articles and has worked with um, places like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the National Academies to really update and um, support new um, understanding of virus transmission. So thank you, Lindsay. So great to have you here today. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here to share my knowledge about airborne transmission of viruses and how we can protect ourselves. Early in the pandemic, one of the biggest questions was, how is the virus transmitting? And the answer is critical because it determines how we can best reduce the risk of transmission. If someone's infected, really what we wanna know is how does the virus get from them to another person? Well, it doesn't just ooze out of our bodies. Um, the coronavirus is in our respiratory fluid. It's in saliva, snot, and the fluid lining our lungs. And it comes out not as naked virus, but in tiny bits of this fluid. So if you look at this slide here, it shows what uh, we medical experts had thought or assumed was happening, that transmission was occurring by large droplets that come out of our mouths when we cough or sneeze, they contain virus, um, and they could spray into someone's eyes, nostrils, or lips, uh, or potentially contaminate another object, um, and that if they enter the body then of the other person, that person would become infected. These droplets are pretty large and they fall quickly to the ground within a distance of six feet, typically. Um, so for a long time, that's what was assumed to happen with most respiratory diseases, uh, with a couple of exceptions, and that was assumed early on for COVID. Next slide. But here's what really happens. We do release some large droplets when we talk, cough, or sneeze, but we also release hundreds of tiny ones that are too small to see, called aerosol particles or just aerosols. Uh, we also release the aerosol particles even when we're just breathing. Uh, these can carry the virus. In fact, they carry more virus than we would expect given their small size. And they're small enough that they can float around in the air for a long time. They're about the same size as cigarette smoke particles. And so they move around in the same way. You can see that the uh, if the person on the left is infected and the other person is close by and in that jet or plume of respiratory aerosols, they're gonna be breathing in a lot of these. In fact, at, at almost all distances, unless they're really uncomfortably close, that person is gonna breathe in more of the aerosols um, than they will have these large droplets land on them. Now, over time, next slide, these aerosol particles can build up in the room, if the person, on the left, the infected person is still there, releasing them into the room. Um, these continue to float around, just like cigarette smoke. They don't stop at six feet. They, they can travel easily across the room. Even if the air in the room feels still, there's always some movement that is carrying these tiny particles around. Next slide. So if the room is poorly ventilated, those are going to continue to build up over time. Next slide. And this would happen not just uh, in the workplace, for example, that's shown here, but also in restaurants or bars, gyms, classrooms, houses of worship, and people's homes, really anywhere that's indoors. And so the, now we see that the person who's farther away is being exposed to the virus particles in the air, in the aerosols, and is breathing them in. If she breathes in enough of them, she could potentially become infected too. Next slide. So how do we reduce the exposure of people in the room? We need to reduce the amount of aerosols in the room and we have well-established ways of doing that. The first is ventilation. If we move more air through that room, bring in 
outdoor air that's virus free and push out the stale air that contains all the, the viral aerosols, then we will reduce or dilute the amount of virus that's in the room, reducing the amount that people in the room are going to breathe, people at a, at a distance. Um, and this can be something as simple as opening the windows or adjusting the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system so that it's bringing in more outdoor air and using less recirculated air. Next slide. Filtration is another good option for reducing the amount of aerosols in a room. Um, this figure shows a portable air cleaner sitting in the middle of the room. And what happens is that it pulls air through it and it has a filter that is very efficient at trapping viruses and other particles on there. And then it pushes clean air out through the other side. And so this effectively reduces the amount of aerosols in the room. You've probably heard of HEPA filters. There are others too. And you may have heard that they achieve, uh, for example, 99% removal at a certain very small size. And you may think, well, does that mean that all smaller particles get through? And in fact, that's not what happened. Not, not what happens. Filtration is not like sieving. You're not sifting through and allowing things that are smaller than a certain size to get through. The way filtration works, in fact, is that smaller particles than that critical size actually are trapped with even higher efficiency. I know it sounds weird, but that's, that's how it, it, it works. That's how the physics works. All right. Um, so in this case, there are fewer aerosol particles in the room and a lower chance that the other people are going to become infected. Now with disinfection, um, I wanna to touch on that. For most situations, ventilation and filtration should be the first options to consider. And disinfection is a, a, an option for higher risk spaces such as cafeterias and schools um, and nursing homes. Disinfection kills the virus, but doesn't physically remove it. You can see that we still have some red dots here are infectious viral aerosols, but we've killed off a lot of the virus. And now those are shown by the gray little gray circles. Um, hospitals have used germicidal UV for a long time near the ceiling. Uh, and this uh, kills off virus that passes through that upper air. And again, the air is constantly moving in a room. So it does, does, does end up getting up there even if it's lower down. Uh, these types of systems need to be carefully specced and installed in order to be effective and safe to avoid exposure of UV to people. There are also a number of emerging technologies um, I would look for those that have been proven in independent real world studies uh, before investing in them. I uh, could stop sharing now, please. So I hope I've left everyone with a better understanding of how airborne transmission works and how it's important to have clean indoor air to reduce the risk of transmission. And I'd like to emphasize that ventilation and filtration are effective tools that everyone can use to help ensure clean indoor air. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I think it's really helpful to see some of the images and understand how these particles move around in the air, even though we often don't see them. Um, so I want to take a few minutes to ask a few questions. I know that of the many um, Zoom attendees that registered, we received many questions during registration, um, in particular about how someone would know if ventilation improvements are actually helping them. Um, so I just wanted to start off to understand a little more about these particles in the air. So how long can uh, the virus, SARS-CoV-2, last in the air? And how far can these particles actually travel? Yeah, that actually has two parts. How far can it last physically? Well, depending on how large the, part, the carrier particle is, again, we don't have naked virus floating around. It's in respiratory droplets and aerosols that even if all the water evaporates, there's a, a ton of other salt and proteins left this goo essentially coating the virus. And depending on how big that is, um, it can last in the air anywhere from minutes to hours in terms of physically floating around. And now another question is how long does the virus actually survive or remain infectious? And we know from sampling studies in hospitals where they have detected infectious virus from the air and also from laboratory studies, my laboratory has conducted lots of these with other viruses, um, they can easily survive for an hour or more when they're floating around in aerosols. They do gradually decay over time. There may be kind of a fast decay at first, but they, they definitely are there uh, and they, they can infect you. Understood. That makes a lot of sense. And 
a kind of related question thinking about, you know, this image of virus particles in the air. I just want to understand, can you explain why don't we get sick every time we're in contact with a sick person? And in particular, you know, what does this have to do with ventilation and the number of particles in the air? There's a number of factors that could be contributing to why we don't get sick every time we're in the room with a, a, an infected person. Uh, the infected person might not be shedding enough virus into the air to, uh, to, to fill the air with, with viruses. Um, some people shed more than others. They could be later in the stages of infection when they're really not shedding much. It could be that we're just not there for a long enough time to breathe in enough of the viruses from the air um, to, to have enough enter our body to cause infection. Um, and then as you saw in some of those figures, good ventilation keeps the level of virus in the air low. So if you happen to be in a room with someone who's infected, they are shedding a lot of virus. If you have good ventilation, that's going to rapidly remove the virus from the air, um, greatly reducing the chance that you're going to breathe in enough of them to become infected. And then finally, there's the, the you know, different people have different immune responses. And even if you are exposed, there's always a chance that you will not become infected. Right, right. That's, that's really helpful to understand. And I'm curious if you could tell us a little more about the science behind how much can ventilation lower your risk of getting infected with COVID? That's something that's still, we're still studying. We know from kind of basic physics, things I've shown you, if you have better ventilation, there's less virus in the air, you'll breathe in less of it, and certainly there's going to be a lower chance of you getting infected. Um, I can mention a couple of studies. There's one um, from the University of Maryland performed by Don Milton and colleagues. He's been studying transmission of viruses through the air longer than most of us. And they looked at one dormitory with low ventilation, another with high ventilation. And they found that the, uh, the one in the one with low ventilation, the rate of respiratory infections in students was four times higher than in the rate of, uh, than in the other dormitory. And then there's been another study that just came out of Italy on COVID, and this has not been peer reviewed yet, um, but the results are consistent with what we would expect based on, um, on modeling and physics. So they went into schools and they installed HVAC systems in some of those schools. And they found that compared to the base case where they had no additional ventilation, where they had low, added low mechanical ventilation from the HVAC system, that seemed to reduce the risk of transmission by about 40%. When they had medium ventilation, it was reduced by over half. And when they had high ventilation, um, they were able to reduce the risk of transmission by more than 80%, or there was that association. So wow. that, it, there's a big, potentially big effect. Yeah, those are really, really powerful numbers to hear. And like you said, this you know we're still learning about the science, but um, it's great to know that ventilation can really have such a big impact on disease transmission. Um, I wanted to ask one other question, and, and Zainab touched upon this a little bit at the beginning, but if you wanted to add any more on just understanding why is it that ventilation is so effective? And really, what does this mean about how COVID spreads between people and you know, how we're understanding that a majority of transmission occurs indoors instead of outdoors. Can you share a little more about the science behind that? Yeah, if, uh, you know, ventilation can be as if we think of like N95s, for example, as the gold standard and reducing our exposure to virus. Um, it filters out virus, so we end up breathing in a lot less of it than we would otherwise, and this greatly reduces our risk of becoming infected. Well, ventilation achieves the same thing, and it does it for everyone, whether, and they don't need to be wearing a mask. If you have great ventilation, you can reduce the amount of virus that's in the air by you know, a factor of five, maybe even a factor of 10. Um, and that is going to reduce everyone's individual risk. Um, we're all breathing all the time, we can't avoid it. Um, we're all sharing the air. And so this is why ventilation has such great potential to help us with um, reducing the risk of transmission of COVID and other respiratory diseases. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lindsay. We really appreciate your time today um, and appreciate that you have dedicated your career to studying you know, this really important topic and helping us understand um, virus transmission through the air. So thank you so much for um, helping us understand and providing such thoughtful explanations today. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Um, excellent. Well, to continue this um, second 
session, um, I'm really excited to introduce the next speaker, um, Dr. Joseph Allen. Joe is an associate professor at um, the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, um, and he began his career leading health investigations of sick buildings across the private sectors, those that might have hazards in the air or other environmental challenges. Um, and now he directs the Healthy Buildings Program at Harvard. And uh, Joe is a public health expert in the field of infectious disease research with over 80 scientific publications. Um, and he also works on wor working with large companies on implementing their healthy building strategies um, into their global portfolios. So we're so excited to have you with us today, Joe. Well, thanks for that nice introduction. And I wanna thank Dr. Nelson of the White House for inviting me. It's quite a privilege. Um, I'm gonna jump right in and talk uh, and, and say something that I wrote two years ago. That is a simple truth. Our buildings can make us sick or keep us well. And this virus was novel, but only in the sense that it was novel to our immune systems. It wasn't novel in terms of how it spread or what we had to do to control this. In fact, we know how to keep people safe in buildings from any hazard, biological, chemical, physical, radiological hazards. But it all starts with what Dr. Mars said. You have to understand how this is spread because then the control strategies flow naturally. And if you acknowledge that airborne spread is happening, then the building matters. And early on in the pandemic, this was missed because we focused on surfaces and that led to the control strategy of cleaning doorknobs, cleaning elevator buttons, people uh, cleaning their groceries. That was a big mistake. So it all flows from airborne transmission. Then those strategies that Dr. Moore mentioned, we have to remove the virus from the air. We can remove it out of the building through ventilation. We can clean it out of the air through filtration. We can inactivate it through uh, germicidal um, uh, UV light. It really is that simple. Now, if we talk about the evidence for how we know this works, Dr. Marr talked about this, is there's met multiple lines of evidence. So first, I agree that, that it starts with basic physics and basics of public health, really, that if you increase ventilation filtration and reduce the amount of virus in the air, you're reducing the intensity of exposure or the inhaled dose, the amount of virus you actually inhale. That decreases your risk. You can also look at the data we have that shows there is hardly any spread outdoors. Why is that? Unlimited ventilation, unlimited dilution. We can look at the spread that happens indoors. Look at all the super spreading events, all time indoors in underventilated, under filtered locations. Doesn't matter if it's the choir practice, restaurant, a bus, spin class. It's the underlying factor that these viral particles and the particles that carry the virus are accumulating uh, indoors. We can also look at decades of scientific literature that shows higher ventilations associated with decreases in transmission of other respiratory diseases like measles, tuberculosis, influenza, and SARS-1 over a decade ago. But here's the problem. We've designed our buildings to bare minimum standards, not health-based standards. In fact, I think most people would be surprised to know that the standard that governs ventilation in your coffee shop, your school, your office, your home is designed, is, is by name, the standard for quote unquote acceptable indoor air quality. Now, I don't know about you or anybody else, I don't want acceptable air quality, I want healthy air quality or optimal indoor air quality. So we've choked off the air supply in our buildings for decades. We get a virus that's spread nearly entirely indoors and that set us up for this massive problem. We have the same problem on the filtration side. Here again, we use bare minimum filters that are designed to protect the equipment, not designed to protect the people. That's a mistake. So I wanna talk about solutions. That's the, the, the point of this meeting. And as, uh, as my brother always says, if we just talk about the problem without solutions, that's called complaining. So let's get to uh, solutions. First and foremost, you wanna tune up your building. Everybody who has a car has dealt with this knows that you have to give your car a tune up. It's not gonna function the same way if you don't change the oil and give it a tune up periodically. We don't do this for buildings consistently. So we have a, a minimum design standard that our buildings are designed to, not enough for health, but then over time, we don't give them a tune-up and the building starts to perform worse. So first and foremost, bring that building back up to the way it was designed. Then you understand your systems and then you can start to make these improvements to go above and beyond. I also wanna point out that if you do that, this process of giving your building a tune-up or what we call commissioning, improves overall indoor air quality and improves energy efficiency. Lawrence Berkeley National Lab estimates this can decrease energy use by 10 to 20%. That's bottom line savings right 
to the building owner, and it's great for climate, of course. So as we think about um, what else we have to do here, we think about um, the multiple benefits that come from doing this, right? We're going to clean the air, and this is great for COVID, but there are many other benefits here. And I wanna start with schools in particular. Many studies have shown higher ventilation rates, higher filtration are associated with better reading scores, better math uh, scores for students, decreases in absenteeism. Uh, we have a study my team wrote uh, a couple of years ago called Schools for Health, over 200 studies showing that the building, the school building influences student health, student thinking and student performance. And actually think about this American Rescue Plan uh, and, and this generational opportunity, this once in a generation opportunity to finally address the decades of neglect of our school infrastructure. This is a powerful tool we're not leveraging to protect our kids and also all the adult workers in the school. The benefits don't just stop with schools. We see this in offices and workers everywhere. Uh, higher ventilation rates associated with fewer missed work days, better cognitive functions, so being able to think more clearly, less fatigue, less headaches. And I'll say this is all real, really common sense, and you've all experienced this. You've all been in a stuffy conference room, a stuffy classroom, a stuffy house. You feel tired, you lose your alertness, and what happens when the door opens or the window opens? Life literally and figuratively gets breathed back into the room. That's ventilation, and that's the power of ventilation. Uh, I wanna make the case that this is uh, also just a good business decision. Because fundamentally, building performance drives human performance, drives business performance. And I'll make the case on three levels. At an individual level, our own research on the benefits of ventilation and cognitive function shows that at a cost of $40 per person per year, we see benefits to the business on the order of six to $7,000 per person per year. That's what happens when you include youth and, uh, health and, and productivity benefits in the analysis. If we look at what happens in the business, I wrote a book, Healthy Buildings, with Harvard Business School professor John Macomber, looking at the economic benefits to better ventilation and healthy building strategies more broadly, and find that when businesses do this, they can see a 10% benefit to the bottom line of the organization. Last, if we think of this from the uh, investor perspective or the owner perspective, our friends and colleagues down the road at MIT just did a study that's showing that healthy buildings, that uh, buildings that are designed and operated to a healthy building standard command effective rents four to 8% higher per square foot. So healthy buildings are just good business decisions. Last, I wanna say healthy buildings uh, and this conversation on ventilation and filtration is really broader than COVID and just ventilation and filtration and air quality. A team released a report we call the nine foundations of a healthy building talking about all of these factors that influence our health in buildings, light, water quality, the chemicals that are in the materials we purchase in our homes, feeling safe and secure in our buildings. The reality is we're an indoor species. We spend 90% of our time indoors. It's intuitive and logical then that the indoor environment has an outsized impact on our health and we've been ignoring it for too long. The very last thing I wanna say is I wanna echo Dr. Nelson's uh, sentiment here that the unsung heroes of the Healthy Buildings Movement are the people who design, operate, manage our buildings, our facility managers and our building managers and I want to just say thank you for keeping us safe. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. And I will echo your last remark um, to say that today with us, we know that you know from registers, attendees, we have HVAC engineers, we have facility managers, we have school building owners, we have restaurant owners, we have many people that think about the you know the health of their buildings and how to keep their occupants safe. Um, and so I think you're you know, speaking to an audience that is, is happy to hear that message. I, I wanted to start, Joe, to ask, you outlined so clearly the economic benefits, the health benefits related to COVID, the benefits beyond COVID. What has, you know, why has it taken so long to recognize this importance or why have we designed buildings without thinking about having a healthy building and really having this positive impact? Yeah, I think we've made mistakes over the past couple of decades. We've lost our way with our focus on uh, energy efficiency and tightening up our building envelopes and a, and a misunderstanding that we can't have both a healthy building and a green and energy efficient building. The reality is we can and we must have both. We can't have uh, an energy efficiency building, energy efficient building that causes disease for people in the building, right? We can't have a healthy building that then uh, causes downstream effects through uh, uh, fossil fuel combustion 
and downstream effects through climate change. So it's, it's been a false dichotomy, right, that we've been presented with. It's one or the other. In fact, it has to be both. And there are ways to do it. And there are many good examples of how to do it. So I don't want people to think the healthy building strategy is somehow at odds with the green building movement. Okay, that's helpful to understand. Um, and I, I wanted to raise a question that we saw many attendees submit, which was, what are the indicators of good air quality? So I work in an office building. When I walk in, what numbers could I look at to know whether the air in my building is good or bad? Yeah, this has been the real challenge. And I think it's why a lot of organizations have stayed with the so-called hygiene theater where you see people cleaning surfaces all day. It's very visible or the, the circles on the floor telling you where to stand. Well, good air quality is invisible. And I think the key here is that organizations have to include this in their communication plan to make the invisible visible. So one, talk about it, promote it, let people know what you have done. You've increased your ventilation rates, you put in MERV 13 filters, these higher grade filters that protect people. And two, we should need to start getting to merging the healthy building movement with the smart building movement using low cost real time sensors for things like carbon dioxide, which is a great proxy for ventilation rate, which starts to put a number on air quality. You can go into a building and actually see what the CO2 level is, the carbon dioxide level. That gives you a hint or a sense of whether or not that's going to be stale air in there or if a lot of fresh outdoor air is coming inside. So we got to start leveraging these new tools. And I think uh, events like this, and quite honestly, the leadership by the White House is putting this on the map in a big way and expectations are changing. I think people are going to walk into buildings and their coffee shop and their school and demand to know what the air quality is like. And Joe, can you tell us a little more about uh, CO2? Why, why is that a proxy for virus? What does it mean? Yeah, so really good question. It's not a proxy for the virus necessarily, but you know we all exhale CO2, and we've used this for a long time as an indicator uh, of how well the space is ventilated, right? So if CO2 is high, that means you have low ventilation and vice versa. So it's not a, a perfect proxy because CO2 just tells you about the ventilation strategy. If you have low CO2, you're in good shape. If you have high CO2, meaning ventilation might be poor, it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad from a COVID standpoint because you could have excellent filtration. The filters don't capture CO2. So like all things, it's another tool in the toolbox. We have to be careful with it, but it's a great tool. And I mean, I'm measuring it in my office right now. So we have portable air quality sensors. People can take these things, buy them on the internet and, uh, and walk into a place and it'll tell you roughly what the CO2 concentration is. And it'll give you a, a quick uh, estimate of how good the air quality is. Got it. One last question. Um, we also have a number of online attendees that are from church or faith-based organizations. And one of the questions that was submitted during the registration was about COVID safety during worship. And the question was, is there any level of indoor air cleaning that will suffice to allow indoor maskless singing in groups like in church choirs? Yeah, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, you know, we see uh, spread happen in places, doesn't matter if it's choir, church, uh, wherever, when we don't meet those fundamentals. Uh, but if you're in uh, a choir or church, you can definitely do this safely if you pay attention to all of these other factors. And I mean, honestly, we should talk about the, the fact is if you're vaccinated and boosted, number one, get that done. That has reduced your risk of severe disease, hospitalization and death. On top of that, we have to put in these great ventilation filtration uh, strategies. But yes, we can keep people safe in any building, right? Once we know the hazard, we know how it's spread, the controls flow from that. And we've done this successfully for the past two years for the organizations that got on top of this and recognized that this is spread through the air. And we hope everybody follows now too. Excellent. Thank you so much, Joe. We really appreciate having you here today and sharing your expertise with us. Well, thanks so much. Real pleasure to be here. Excellent. Um, and thank you to both of the speakers in this session, um, to Joe and Lindsay for sharing the science behind clean indoor air. Um, you really provided some great, clear explanations for why we should care about our indoor air and some simple steps we can take. Um, so thanks for your tireless work on this topic. And next, I'd like to pass it on to my colleague at OSTP, Dr. Steph Guerra, who is Senior Policy Advisor for Biosecurity for our next section. Steph. Thank you, Georgia. And thanks so much to our first speakers. It's really a who's who in clean indoor air. It's been a pleasure to listen to you all this morning. I now have the pleasure of introducing our next expert, Mr. Ken Martinez, who will share with us the basics of how we can take care of indoor air. Ken is an environmental engineer and industrial hygienist with experience in leading and conducting large scale research and managing programs in occupational safety and health and emergency response. 
He has more than 33 years of experience at the CDC in hazardous agent exposure characterization and mitigation control practices in the manufacturing and healthcare industries. Mr. Martinez is a recognized subject matter expert in biological agents and currently serves as the chief science officer at the Integrated Bioscience and Built Environment Consortium. Ken, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Steph, for that introduction. So I wanna thank OSGP from the beginning for the opportunity to present. This is a high level overview of environmental control strategies that can be used to reduce, reduce the risk of airborne disease transmission in the built space. Vaccination is important. Human diagnostics testing is critically important as well during the pandemic. But given that the primary route of COVID-19 transmission is airborne, and you've heard this echo from Dr. Nelson and from Dr. Marr and Dr. Allen, that environmental control strategies should be complementary. okay? We need to continue this discussion further to cement what we've learned about healthy built environments as a result of COVID-19. All of my remarks today are traceable to my work history of 40 years in the indoor air quality and bioaerosols, including focus on infectious uh, disease transmission. It's also based on CDC recommendations, guidance from the Integrated Bioscience and Built Environment Consortium and the American Industrial Hygiene Association. If you are interested in a more detailed collection of digestible information on these specific topics, I refer you to the Commit to Care website, which is uh, a partnership that IBEC has with the American Industrial Hygiene Association. Uh, Commit to Care is a grassroots campaign that is a partnership, as I said, between IBEC and IHA to provide greater awareness and understanding on environmental mitigation strategies in the built space. There is no charge to participate. So let's start uh, on a very basic level, risk assessment. Each of us conducts risk assessment as we move through the world every day. We consider the risks and things we do, such as choosing to drive a car. Some of us choose not to wear seatbelts, choose to ride a bike, some of us without helmets. We eat foods that are perhaps unhealthy, or we play contact sports that put us at risk of injury. But how do we assess risk when it comes to highly transmissible infectious diseases such as COVID-19? And how will this assessment impact our choices regarding moving in a new normal? For example, we all understand that healthcare workers are high risk because of the potential to interact with someone who is infected with COVID-19. I encourage you to consider your server at a restaurant to be at high risk. They come to a table where people by design are eating unmasked, they're talking, they're laughing uh, and breathing. And so you, that server does not know if someone's infectious, if they're vaccinated. So they're unprotected when they interact in that space. And we have boiled down the risk factors to, uh, to risk factors and risk mitigations uh, considerations into a simplified process that I want to present to you here today. And we call that the four Ds. With regard to risk factors, right? You heard uh, Dr. Marr talk about the uh, disease distance um, or, or rather the aerosol concentration of that individual. But let's consider a group of people as we did in the restaurant, all sitting around, talking, meeting, discussing. Well, you don't know who's vaccinated or who's not. Even if those people who are not wearing masks, they could be unvaccinated and you don't know who is infected because a lot of times uh, that we're seeing today is that in your vaccinated state, you could present with no symptoms at all. So these, someone in that group of people could be disseminating airborne viruses. So density, you need to consider that when walking in the room. The second point is duration. How long will you be in that room? where there could be potential aerosol particles in there with, with that effect that have viruses in them. So you need to consider how long, the longer you're there, the increase you're, is, you are in as far as your risk of disease transmission. Regarding risk mitigation factors, we focus on distance and dilution. And two things that all of the speakers here this morning have addressed. Distance has to do with that, um, where Dr. DeFucci said, distance does matter. It does matter. But as you saw from Dr. Mars' slides, as you move away from that infected individual, the particles tend to disseminate, they spread apart. So the concentration that you come in contact with at a farther distance is much, much less. But the scientific literature is abundant with case studies of super spreader events where people have been infected at distances of 10, 20, 30 feet away when they're in the same room. So distance becomes important, but you need to recommend it's not, and remember it's not everything. Dilution is the everything, and you heard this from Dr. Allen, Dr. Marr, is that the more we can ventilate the indoor air space through filtration and outdoor air introduction, the better we can become. So let's focus on those concepts. As far as dilution, when we look at big buildings, 
Larger buildings are designed to bring in outdoor air, and that serves two primary functions, one of which more outdoor air dilutes pollutants. As I was going to engineering school, we were always taught the solution to pollution is dilution. The second function is that it provides free cooling and heating during certain times of the season. For example, during the springtime, when it's cooler outside, we can increase the amount of outdoor air and we don't have to cool that air because it's already chilled, if you will. However, when we increase the amount of air, it does increase energy costs. And you heard Dr. Nelson allude to this, as well as Dr. Barr as well. So these and Dr. Allen. So you need to consider the, the impact on energy costs. When we look at our homes, it is rare to have outdoor air introduced into an HVAC system that is installed into a home. Therefore, outdoor air come, only comes in in the home through opening windows. Now, I will also say as far as ventilation and introducing outdoor air. If you open up a window in a building that has a ventilation system, you will impact the air quality in that space because it tends to tendency to have a negative impact on how that HVAC system is moving air. Next, I'd like to focus on filtration. ASHRAE currently recommends increasing your filtration rates to a MERV 13. This gives you an approximately 85% efficiency and removing of various sizes of particles. The problem that we have is will the system work with increased filtration? Because as you increase filtration efficiency, you also create greater resistance to air movement. That results in making your HVAC system um, motor components working harder. So I would refer you to the HVAC professional to understand if that's really going to work for you. As I said before, opening windows can have a negative impact on the performance of the HVAC simple. I'll give you a quick example of a church that I supported here locally. They had four different ventilation systems in this building, but they were all home type units and they were in very, very tight spaces. When I looked at the filter box, they had no room to include, to include or, or substitute in higher efficiency filters. So I worked with them to install portable air cleaners in rooms that they use quite a bit, the Great Hall and the Sanctuary. And we also put ceiling fans on the top to get better air mixing. Because if you just put a portable air cleaner in there, it's going to have a tendency to recirculate the air in a limited space. With regard to homes, same as buildings, the system that is in your home may not be able to, to handle the increased resistance. Newer systems are more likely to work. Older systems, not so much. So as I mentioned previously, uh, homes rarely have the capability built in to introduce outdoor air. However, opening windows and doors works, works very, very well in a home environment, um, but it is seasonal dependent. You've heard um, some of the speakers before talk about supplemental air cleaning technologies. There are two tried and true technologies, portable air cleaners, um, preferably HEPA filters. You do not need supplemental technologies other than the filter. However, Carbon is okay because carbon does a really good job in these systems for removing odors. With regard to GUV or germicidal ultraviolet radiation, it is a proven technology. It is used widely in healthcare and laboratories. However, there are implementation and maintenance issues that include potential health impacts if not installed properly. And personally, I do not recommend the use of these systems for the home. With regard to a lot of the emerging technologies that we're seeing right now as a result of car uh, COVID-19, I ask the buyer to beware. Research the seller, request that they provide evidence on the science, and uh, please avoid technologies that message microorganism kill in occupied spaces. So in conclusion, I would invite you to join our Commit to Care campaign. Again, it is at no cost. Um, and would also consider you, can ask you to consider visiting the IBEC website, website to learn more about that body of work. Steph? Yeah, thanks so much, Ken. You fit a lot of information into a very short period of time, so very <laughs> impressed by that. Appreciate you talking through the practical steps that any of us can take to improve indoor air quality. I just want to follow up um, with another question based on uh, feedback we got from our attendees today. Um, from what you said so far, it seems like there are many different actions we can take and that the best choice will vary by building setting. So, for example, we received a question from one of our attendees from Hawaii who asked about how to improve air in facilities that don't have HVAC systems. Um, so could you give us a few more examples from your work about how you can customize your action plan depending on the setting? Yes, it's about the directional flow there. So for the example that you provided about Hawaii, 
if you open up the windows on one side of the building and windows on the other side, you're hoping to get the wind and pressurization to move the air through the building. If you open up only one side of the windows, you're not gonna get that movement. The same could be true as I was uh, with CD, my work with CDC, we were involved with um, tuberculosis control in health clinics, jails and, and whatnot. So if I knew that there was infectious patients in a particular space and they didn't have a, uh, a newer upgraded uh, ventilation system, I put, might put a ceiling, uh, a fan that blows outside to create a negative pressure space that would again, create that, that, that air movement and keep that contaminated air in the room and then uh, push it outside to the outdoors. And therefore the hallways and other parts of the building would remain uncontaminated. Great, thanks so much. And as you alluded to in your remarks, um, we've been receiving a lot of questions about new technologies out there that claim to be safe and effective for cleaning indoor air. Um, so if you could speak a little bit more about how folks can discern the real deal from potentially ineffective or even harmful machines and technologies. It goes to back what I said before, any time you put something into the air that is occupied and they say we can kill this percentage of particles, understand that we are micro, nothing more than a compilation of cells, microorganisms. So if it's going to kill bacteria, fungi, virus, it's likely to have an impact on us as well. So that's why I ask you know, the buyer beware, ask for the scientific evidence. A lot of these technologies that you're seeing, uh, seeing on the market today are, are largely unproven by you know, third party sources that are really uh, looking at these things very, very carefully. The best thing you can do is go back to what we know does work, filtration. And if you need to, ultraviolet, uh, germicidal ultraviolet uh, radiation has been proven effective as well. So go back to the things that do work, outdoor air filtration. And they're the least expensive of the options as well. Great. Thank you. Um, and now that we're all sort of going back out into the world, sometimes even without masks, how can people be aware of indoor air? So when you kind of enter a public space, like what are the building features you look for when you're thinking about um, whether or not the indoor air is uh, safe for you to breathe? That's a more complicated, complicated question, Steph. But I go back to that's why I presented the one component on risk assessment. Every time we walk into a room, you want to look to see if people are gathering, they're not social distancing. Um, we know that a lot of the mandates regarding mask mating, mask mandating being pulled. So you still want to keep your distance in there. If you see someone had put a portable air cleaner in there, you can feel yourself, tell yourself, feel grateful about, they care about the air quality. They're doing something supplemental because you won't be able to see that increased filtration in the building system. So it's about conducting your own risk assessment, in my opinion, and weighing those risk factors, duration, you know, spend shorter amount of time in there, um, looking to see if they're diluting the air through portable air cleaners, um, keeping your distance from other folks as well, and not gathering as tightly as we would have before. Great, great. Well, we are close to time. You know, time really flies when you're clearing the air here. So um, one last question for you, Ken. Um, what is the one thing you hope more people do to take care of indoor air as a result of this conversation? Become more aware about what they can do. And I, I go back to what I said before about our Commit to Care program. Simply, the reason we gave it that name is we wanted people to, to commit to caring about their family members, their neighbors, their coworkers, the community, by learning what are these basic things that they can be aware of and do with regard to dilution, density, direction, and um, density, and keeping those in mind and showing a commitment to protecting not only themselves, but, their, but others as well. Great. Wonderful. Thanks again, Ken, for giving us some actionable guidance. Um, just want to say there are some additional resources available online, including through EPA's recently released Clean Air in Buildings Challenge that can help you dive deeper into these decision points. Now it's my pleasure to pass the Zoom mic over to my colleague, Dr. Erica Kimmerling, Senior Policy Advisor for Public Engagement in Science. Erica? Thank you, Steph. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the, our last speaker for this event, a person I know to be passionate about improving public health, Mrs. Tracy Washington Enger. Mrs. Tracy Washington Enger has uh, worked at the Environmental Protection Agency for over 25 years, creating safe, healthy, pristine school indoor air environments. She works with communities from around the country and internationally facilitating events which generate action to address critical health and environmental in issues. She received her BS and MS in journalism from Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. Thank you so much, Tracy, for joining us here 
today. Uh, so as I said, you've worked on this issue for 25 years. Can you tell us a little bit more about your work at the Environmental Protection Agency? Absolutely. It is my pleasure, Erica. And again, I want to thank you for, for having us, having me here today and getting to share some of my passion for indoor air quality in schools. Um, and like you said, so, you know, the first thing I want people to understand is that while we are enjoying a, a great moment of attention and urgency around indoor air quality, EPA has been at this since 1988. So we have been on the playing field for indoor air quality for a long time. And our focus on schools began in 1994 with the introduction of our indoor air quality tools for schools kit that was in response to a GAO report that indicated how many schools were having issues with their building facilities and especially with their HVAC systems. And so we put together this action kit for schools to, you know, to take action on, on improving indoor air quality. And you know, when we put it together to be used in action, so there are checklists and model plans and wheels and videos, right? And we were so excited when we put it out there and, and we didn't just do guidance in a book to sit on a shelf, you know, it was in a box and had this great you know, little Velcro uh, closure that made this very satisfying sound when it opened up, right? So we were really excited about it. And when it didn't fly off the shelves, we were shocked because we knew that people needed this and, and were asking for it. And so after we put the kid out there, we then went out and we actually talked to school districts. We did this thing that government seldom does, but we should do, but we're doing more of, right? We talked to our end user about what, why they were or were not using it. And based on that, we put together our framework for continuous um, success and for effective IQ management. And it addressed things like organization and communication, which you know Dr. Allen was talking about that importance of, of communication, all of these continuous improvement strategies that created like a roadmap for schools to use to put it into place. And then we identified the areas that they really needed to address everything from HVAC systems, but also mold and moisture and integrated pest management and source control, all of these issues. Um, and, and that became our knowledge base. And then we grabbed all of those folks who were using the kit and we turned them into our faculty, really peer mentors for their other school districts across the country. And then we put in place things like our professional training web, uh, webinar series, where we could then connect all of those folks out there in our network to all of our knowledge resources. And that kind of comprises all of the components of the program that we have to help school districts put in place comprehensive IAQ management plans. So one of our other speakers actually got to this a little bit already um, about why indoor air quality is specifically important in schools, but I really do think it's important to take a step back and talk about why it matters in a school setting, what's different about it, and can you get into that a little bit more for us? Absolutely. I think it's really important for people to understand that where students learn is just as important as what they learn. And we put all of these investments as we should in having the best instructors, having the, you know, the best equipment, you know, having the best curriculum. But what I want people to understand is that that school building, that school building facility is a part of the curriculum. It has that much impact on the kinds of outcomes that we're trying to achieve in schools. And so what I mean by that is we talk about clean indoor environments and, and healthy learning environments being, uh, being propped upon a three-legged stool of school facility management, certainly. You know, how we're managing those facilities is important, but it is important because of the impact that it has on the health of the occupants. And that health of the occupants extends beyond just uh, just the moment that we're in with, you know, with, with the pandemic, but with all control of numerous um, impacts, health impacts that are there. And we know that health isn't just the absence of disease. It is really looking at the overall health that helps address things like absenteeism. If you have a student who can't be in that, A, if you have a school that can't be open because of indoor air quality, or you have a student who can't be there, because of absenteeism due to asthma or flu or, or the pandemic, that is learning that you are not gonna get back. That is a learning loss that you are not, that is a cost that you cannot recoup. And that cost is then also associated with 
presenteeism as well. If you have students in the classroom who are unable to attend, then that's that third leg of the stool talking about academic performance. So indoor air quality has a direct impact, not just on the facility, but on the health outcomes schools are trying to achieve and the academic performance outcomes they're also trying to achieve. So you and I were talking yesterday about how schools are a little bit of a, you know, that unique benefits and unique challenges. And one of the things you said to me is that kids are not just many adults and that that actually matters for our interventions. And I, I feel it's really important to get into a little bit about the who is in the building and why that matters for how we approach this. Absolutely. You know, we have unique challenges when we're addressing indoor air quality in schools, in part because of the vulnerable populations that are in there, right? We take our children, we take, you know, our national treasure and they're in there. And children are not just a little scale down of adults. Physiologically, they are different, right? They have, you know, they breathe deeper and faster. So they're more vulnerable and more susceptible to a lot of the exposures. They have hand to mouth activities that they are what one of my friends calls um, belly botanists, right? So they're on the ground all the time and then touching their faces and touching their noses and touching all of these things. So we, so they are especially susceptible and they are in an environment that is a unique facility. It's not like a commercial space or like a home. There are activities going on in a school building that are kind of unique to that school building. In addition to the, you know, food preparation and, you know, bus idling and, you know, the equipment that's there. So in addition to those spaces often being overcrowded and spaces being used in the way that they were not designed to be used. So we have, you know, offices in custodial closets. I've seen it, right? So we also have to think about how we are controlling for indoor air quality in that unique space recognizing that we are dealing with really unique and vulnerable populations, our children, and what and how we then make choices about not just the HVAC system, but everything from the roof to the flooring and everything in between, how we make smart choices about source control and about making smart material selections, how we control for pests, how we control for mold, everything because of the, the importance of the impact that it's gonna have on those vulnerable kids and staff who are likely to be in that building for four or five times as long as any student. So, you know, as we said, you've been on this issue of clean indoor air before it was cool. And I think we can say that it's cool now. Um, and in a recent NPR article, you described it as a bit of a, the pandemic as being a bit of a hallelujah moment. And I actually wanna get into that and what you mean by that and what it actually means for indoor air in schools and what's changed now? Yeah, so, you know, I don't want anyone to think that I'm celebrating the pandemic, but I am celebrating this moment that we have that we're able to seize on because, I, you know, it's, I call it the three A's of what's changed. It is awareness, you know, and that's kind of what Ken was talking about, the importance of raising awareness around this issue and the urgency, but it has also led us to a point where we have better ability to address these issues now because of all of the resources and all of the guidance and all of the investments that are being made. And that allows us to move into better action. And so we see more schools putting our guidance into action and coming and, you know, and, and we wanna come out of this crisis with ongoing and lasting um, outcomes and commitments. And so we're really trying to help create that lasting change because what we have seen is the school districts who came into this pandemic already with our program in place, having proactively taken steps to put our program in place, were grounded in the best practices and the best policies and the best principles. So when the pandemic came, it really was just a tweaking. It was a pivot for them. They were able to kind of pivot and make the, the changes that were necessary, but they weren't starting from ground zero. But the thing is, if you want to pivot, I mean, we hear that word so much right now. If you want to pivot, you have to have one foot grounded in something. If you aren't grounded solidly, you aren't pivoting. You're just reeling and spinning out of control. And we have seen that too, unfortunately. So we want to come out of this with more school districts grounded in a solid IAQ program that will allow them to pivot successfully when the next crisis comes along, because we know it's coming. 
So on that point of being nimble and being taking action, in our last question, I really want to talk about what are the what are the resources, what's available, materials, tools. Like we want people to leave with some idea of where they can go to keep engaging on this topic. Absolutely. So you know, so one of the benefits that has come out of this 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 moment is that. EPA, you know, all of the resources that we have that I mentioned for your indoor quality program, but also our friends at Department of Energy, you know, have their uh, sustainable and healthy uh, initi schools initi in initiative that's focusing on that, um, that false dichotomy, that, that fake sort of uh, that, that, uh, that Dr. Allen talked about, really balancing indoor quality and energy and that it doesn't have to be some Faustian choice, we really can do both along with the unprecedented amounts of funding that are finally being directed towards school infrastructure through the ARP funds. So we have all of these assets right now and all of these resources that we can leverage in this moment. And I just wanna make sure that we don't squander them, right? And so the clean air in buildings uh, challenge and the fact sheet has provided an opportunity for us to really coalesce around this with all of the White House attention that it has brought and the Biden-Harris administration committing to indoor air quality provides us as a federal family, a place to really marshal all of our resources together. And so when you look at that fact sheet, you know, it really is like, the, the in, when you look at that fact sheet, it's a portal for you to be able to enter into for a galaxy of resources that you can tailor to get you know, specific outcomes for your specific the school facility. So we really, the secret sauce of that fact sheet is in the links. Don't skip the links, click on the links so that you can really design what you need for your, for your school and for your facility. Because the thing is, this fact sheet, all of this information, everything that we're doing is only as good as what people do when they put it into action. And it is critical right now that we really, it's become my tagline, but I mean it, we take this moment that we have that has been brought to us you know, by this pandemic, that we take this moment that we see turning into a movement as school districts are putting things into action. But if we are really careful and if we are with intention design and use these resources that we have, we can take this moment that's becoming a movement and turn it into a monument for lasting indoor air quality and lasting healthy space, learning spaces for students for generations to come. We cannot squander this moment. Thank you so much, Tracy. Uh, I wish we had more time together. I could talk to you all day and just thank you for your passion and your years of public service. I know it's made me, made me more excited to work on this topic, to talk to you. So thank you so much for everything and your time with us here today. Well. Thank you as well. And I, and I do look forward to the work that we will continue to do to, in support of school, uh, school districts across the country. Really excited, so thank you. Thank you. So it is now my pleasure to bring on one final speaker. Uh, we are bringing on Mary Wall, the Senior Policy Advisor for the White House COVID Response Team to actually share a little bit more uh, information about the Clean Air and Buildings Challenge that Tracy mentioned and said had click on all the links that is the Clean Air and Buildings Challenge. Mary, can you tell us a little bit more about it and the work of the White House COVID team? Hi, yeah, thanks, Erica. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's really great to be with you all. Um, just wanna say thanks uh, off the top to Dr. Nelson and convening and, uh, and driving this important conversation today. Uh, also wanna make sure to give thanks to everyone else who is uh, here on the call. It's been a really uh, important community and conversation to learn from. So thank you for that. Um, and as I've said many times to the people here who you've heard, today, heard from today, uh, I think that all of the work that um, the administration is championing right now is really standing on uh, decades of experience um, from our federal experts and from experts outside of government as well. Um, and work that we've seen uh, across and before the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's as a way to just kind of say thank you for all that you've done uh, and really um, making sure that it is easy for people to access change on this important topic. Um, we, Erica, had put together uh, the National COVID-19 Preparedness Plan 
Uh, and this is our, our the, the president's path for the next phase of the pandemic. We really sit in early March. Um, and that plan is really focused on kind of a couple of core activities. One is protecting against COVID-19, two is preparing for new variants, and three is preventing economic and educational shutdowns. Um, and on that last piece is we're really focused in on indoor air quality. Uh, the Clean Air and Buildings Challenge, which we launched, I think somewhere in the neighborhood of 10-ish days ago, uh, it came from uh, a, uh, a, the, the fact sheet that um, Tracy had mentioned um, and it links to a document from the EPA uh, that is specifically providing a real clear distillation and synopsis of actions that any building uh, and leader could take in order to improve indoor air quality. Um, this really does serve as a challenge, as a call to action for all building owners and operators. Uh, and that includes certainly schools and other community settings, but um, we also think this applies uh, in the commercial and other sectors as well. And we really want to make sure that everyone can use this moment uh, to take action. Uh, it is a guide uh, that is a, especially for, uh, I say this with all the love and respect to all the experts here, it tries very hard to really kind of boil down as much information as possible into two pages and as Tracy had mentioned, has a lot of links to learn more. And that's the idea. We want this to be a first step. We want it to be a place where you can come together with your building community, create an action plan, and, and make those improvements. It is both about the things that I know uh, I heard Ken talk about earlier that are quick wins and quick fixes. It's also about long-term investments. Um, we are grateful that we have uh, the infrastructure, at, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law as well as the American Rescue Plan to support this in a lot of our public spaces. Uh, but again, we really want to, we want to promote beyond that as well and make sure that all buildings can take action. Um, so I will leave it there in just saying that this is, you know, we, we really do view as a White House and as an administration, uh, the improvement of indoor air quality as a key component in our, both in our fight against COVID-19, um, in preparing for the future of this pandemic that is still with us, as well as to reap all of the health benefits and learning benefits and community benefits that comes um, with having high quality indoor air. So excited to have this partnership with uh, everyone who's joining here today. Uh, and I will toss it back to you, Erica. Thank you so much, Mary, for all of your hard work and the whole COVID response team. I wanna just thank, as we wrap up, thank our amazing group of experts who joined us here today to share their insights on this essential topic. I also wanted to thank all of you for tuning into this discussion of the science behind clean indoor air and getting into why we really should care about this issue and take action. And I do hope all of you who joined us will be inspired to act. Uh, we at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy are committed to engaging on this topic, including with the stakeholders that are on this call. And we are committed to building a whole of government coalition to drive forward innovative practices and technologies for pandemic preparedness, this work actually has already begun through our Pandemic Innovation Task Force, which in addition to work on accelerating safe, effective vaccines, therapeutics, antivirals, early detection, and so much more, um, is working on ways to reduce indoor air tra transmission. This team aims to drive technology and implementation in, in innovation in building design, indoor air quality monitor monitors, pathogen sensors, and air disinfection technologies, we're also working to elevate indoor air quality interventions as key parts of our public health strategy and to establish federal buildings as an exemplar of indoor air quality innovation. So thank you all so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.